welcome into the PFF NFL podcast. Steve Palazzolo here with Sam Monson. It's the YouTube PFF NFL podcast. Yes. YouTube only, guys. Mm-hmm. If you're trying to listen on your podcast device right now, can't happen. Doesn't yeah. exist. I mean, you're not going to find this. So this you is won't, a secret. This is it's gone quite meta quite quickly. This is the PFF NFL bonus show for YouTube only. We're live on a Wednesday morning. How you doing, Sam? Doing good, Steve. How about you? Doing great. Excellent. Any other fodder to kick things off here? No, no, no. That's not. That's done. Niceties are out of the way. Let's, that's let's get into the show. Oh wait, tell me about the rugby. No, no, no you'll it's chaos, talk Steve. About it Typhoons everywhere. Madness. All I know is Gordon's upset, right? Yeah. That's too bad. Sorry, Gordon. Um, go Irish or something. That's our team. Ireland. Ireland. Go Irish. No. Like Notre Dame. You guys are like Notre Dame. No. All right. As we do every Wednesday, we're going to do a little Stevenson watch. It is the Stevenson Award, the top award over here at PFF. It's for the best player in the NFL, regardless of position. It's our highest graded player and not the most valuable. No. So... Let's take a look. It has tightened up at the top, Sam. Now that we, the data set has, you know, really, you know, increased a little bit. We're in week five. And if got, you know, there's some guys that were at the top who have dropped off a little bit, and there's some guys maintaining their spot. Let's start on the offensive side of the ball. A bunch of guys with grades over 90. The top grade right now, though, George Kittle. Yeah. Tight end from the 49ers. George Kittle is really, really good. He's legitimately. I think he's become the best tight end in the NFL. He's taken over from the Gronk mantle. Everyone assumed it would be Travis Kelsey. Travis Kelsey's still really good, but he hasn't had, I mean, he's had some drops, hasn't had quite the impact that we would have expected from him, whereas George Kittle has legitimately picked up where he left off a year ago, where he was so dominant. His role, I think, is only going to increase over the next few weeks because um, Kyle Juszczyk has gone down with a sprained knee, so Kittle is basically their primary offensive weapon right now. He's he's pretty awesome. I, I like the the various different positions that we have atop there. Chris Godwin having a great season for the Bucks at wide receiver. He's a ninety one point four right now. Quentin Nelson coming off of just an incredible game on Sunday night, the left guard for the Indianapolis Colts. Uh ninety point nine grade for him. Same as Christian McCaffrey, the running back from the Panthers, who's getting a lot of MVP hype right now. My favorite Christian McCaffrey stat. He's got like hundred and fifty more yards than the Jets. What? Yeah. Yikes. He's got 800 and something. The Jets have like 700 and 700 odd. Yeah, so McCaffrey yeah. is up there as a receiver and a runner, playing really well. And then Russell Wilson, our top-graded quarterback, 90.7 right now. So all of those guys really tight in the running on the offensive side of the ball for the Stevenson. Yeah. I, I think, you know, McCaffrey has become this phenomenal running back for the Panthers. Um, he's helped by the fact that right now, Kyle Allen, as we talked about before, he's bringing accuracy to the table. He's able to get the ball in his hands where it needs to be, maximize yards after the catch, which, you know, a poor, an accurate pass but poor, poor ball location won't necessarily do. You know, it'll stop the receiver. It'll make the linebacker catch him up, you know, basically eliminate the separation that he just got in the route. Um, with, like the one-handed catch he had against the Texans to seal the deal, right? Where Allen essentially missed the throw and McCaffrey one-handed it. So that's a good example. A yeah, like a, a well, a perfect ball location could have, could have allowed McCaffrey to keep running, gain a, a ton of extra yards. Poor ball location made him basically lay out, fall to the floor, and skid forward for a couple. Um, generally, Kyle Allen has been much better at that than Cam Newton, though in that particular throw he was. Yeah, sorry, I was showing it both ways. Um, Russell Wilson playing at an extremely high level, like I said. Our top-graded quarterback right now, uh, a ton of big-time throws, not turning it over. He's been accurate to all levels, so a lot to like about all of those guys right now. How about on the defensive side of the ball? Once you hit that certain snap threshold, hey, look, it's Aaron Donald and Khalil Mack both tied with 90.7 grades. Yeah, I mean, Donald, back to the top. It took took a few weeks, took a while, but all he needed to do was to play the Seahawks and then... Aaron Donald is right back where he belongs, crushing the rest of the field. Um, this was a game that you kind of saw coming in terms of one, because you know one sack, fifteen total pressures heading into this game. It was pretty inevitable that at some point he was going to look better than that. Right. Um, two, because the Seahawks' offensive line going up against Aaron Donald is just a perennial mismatch, and nothing they do changes that. Um, you know they have skewed towards these big-bodied, slow-moving 
road grading, run specialist type offensive lineman in a in a league where A, that's never been less what everybody else is doing, and B goes completely against how you deal with Aaron Donald. So inevitably this was set up for Aaron Donald to have a pretty dominant game. That's what happened, and now he's back to the summit. Yeah, so he's up there. Um, Khalil Mack did have a quieter game yeah. against uh, his former team and the Raiders, but still, we're talking about body of the work, body of work for the rest, you know, for the entire season. Um, there's a lot of edges and defensive linemen, very essentially bunched together. Yeah, they're all they're all pretty tight. But if we just look at a few, you know, Grady Jarrett's up there with a 90.2. But if we look at a couple other positions, Jamie Collins, we mentioned about just the ridiculous action, you know, stat line that he's putting up, had another sack. Um, so he keeps piling up sacks and interceptions, but overall playing extremely well. 90.2, that entire Patriots defense playing really well. And then Marcus Williams, I threw him up on the list because the safety from the Saints. Um, we, we mentioned Devin McCourty last week, and it's like, all right, the dude's probably not going to pick off 16 passes this year. Mm. He'll slow down a little bit. He could, didn't pick off a pass last week, so he slowed down. But Marcus Williams has been probably the most consistent safety in the NFL this year, 89.4 grade for him. Yeah, um, this is uh, at- the list of players that are so tightly bunched is pretty fascinating. You know, J.J. Watt looks kind of all the way back. Yeah. Um, we've got Joey Bosa on fire. Um, there's a bunch of those guys in there. And then my uh, little fun stat. Joey or Nick? Uh, Joey, but Nick has probably also propelled himself right up the list. Nick just uh, had that game. nine pressures on 25 yeah. snap uh, rushes the other night. The McCourty the twins? Yeah. Same grade. In coverage. Shh. Don't ruin my, don't ruin my number. I don't like lying. Look, look. People have premium stats 2.0. They can go check and call you on Sometimes it. Sometimes you got to bend the truth and make a funny, a funny little. They have the same coverage grade. Dink. Dink. They're the same guy. Yeah, exactly. That's what it's I'm saying. Like they share DNA and coverage grade. Hmm. Remember when they were like, there was the good one, the bad one. Yeah, they're both playing well. They're both yeah, both good. That's how that's ruined our whole joke of you know. Uh, there was the one time Jason's Jason re- going to go to the Patriots and Devin's just going to like play his role for a while, make him look good. They play those up. tricks on Belichick every all the time. Maybe that's what they're doing, snap by snap, just changing. Yeah. So you can never Devin tell. Devin, they have numbers on their jersey. Oh, did I ruin a joke again? Yeah, again. Oh. Uh-huh. Devin, I'll just play safety on this one. You go play corner. I, you haven't played corner since 2012. I'll let you take a few snaps out there. Yeah. They probably could when uh-huh. you're playing, you know, like Luke Falk and right. Colt McCoy. You probably – look, McCourty – We'll just have McCordy line up here and McCordy line up there. Don't care which one. Figure it out. Yeah. I want a McCordy here and a McCordy there. You decide amongst yourselves which one it is. That's versatility. Right. That's all I'm interested in. Belichick continues to be just ahead of the game. DJ Reader is still dominant, by the way. Oh, so, yeah, that was the guy. I had to cut off because he's under 200 snaps yeah. so far this year. But still wrecking people. Right. But his grade is above Aaron Donald. So, if we're saying at the end of the year – Here's the thing with the Stevenson. Volume matters. Mm-hmm. So if DJ Reader at the end of the year has, say, 500 snaps, 600 snaps, and you've got an Aaron Donald or a Khalil Mack up at eight or 900, um, you know, the volume does matter there. But on a snap-for-snap basis, DJ, DJ, DJ Reader is the highest-graded defensive player so There's far. a few players where at the start of every year, you know, week by week by week, the, you get more snaps that accumulate. There are guys that, you know, Aaron Donald, you're waiting for him to come back to the top, which is where he usually is. And right. then there are other players who are kind of waiting for them when do they drop off, right? This is an incredibly impressive performance, but it's in really low sample size. After a few weeks, that guy's not that good. He's going to drop away. And, you know, Kamoko Ture was one of those players. Poor guy wrecked his ankle. So, like, that isn't going to happen. But he was another one that was sort of sustaining that run in limited snaps. Right. And then DJ Reader. It's like, when is DJ Reader going to go back to being DJ Reader? And so far, it hasn't happened. He keeps chunking out these 85-plus great games. But he's been solid the last couple of years. It's not like he's been bad. No, his, but his career's been you don't good. Ex- I'm just saying, you don't expect him to be grading at 92 at the oh, top agreed. of the league, right? Agreed. So at some point, you're like, when does the re- average game come along and bump him back down the list? And it, is, it isn't yet. We're now like five straight games or four straight games with um, you know 85-plus grades. Right. It's all rolling in. Maybe, he's, maybe he is that good. I like it, and you know that's why we do what we do. Because um, while there are guys like Aaron Donald and Khalil Mack who always seem to be sitting there at the top, there's always guys like DJ Reader, Chris Godwin, George Kittle, guys that that break out, and um, we can highlight them with PFF grades. So it's your Stevenson Award watch, PFF's highest award. We'll give it out at the end of the year. We'll be checking in every Wednesday with the top graded players around the NFL. All right, let's move on. Mailbag time. Yeah, we have some questions. I got a question. 
this is the second straight week you have not given me any questions to prepare for. Yeah. Uh huh. I don't like it. No. Okay. Well, no, because I'm doing. We're doing a disservice. I don't know that that's going to change to our listeners how I approach this because all right, you know. So this question is from Sam Morris, an Australian Texan superfan, apparently. Hmm. Um, hey guys, love the show. Tune in every episode. I'd love to hear what you think about a few of the Texans players. We've already covered DJ Reader, um, but specifically the early returns on the offensive line upgrades. Upgrades, he says, as if, well, we'll be the judge of that. Like Titus Howard, Max Sharping, and Laramie Tunsil. So, how has this, let's talk about this Texans offensive line generally, and then probably we'll end up folding in a little bit of the sort of relationship with um, quarterback. Deshaun Watson in there as well, because that's always going to be relevant to how the Texans' offensive line is playing. So the Texans' offensive line has been has crept back toward average. There you go. They've done it. Didn't I order a shirt? Where's did, my shirt? I don't know. Did you order a shirt? I don't know if I specifically did, but I kind of like. Well, that's. I, I kind of like yelled into the office, like, "Hey, I want, I want that shirt. I, I thought we just get the shirt so we can, so I can wear it." It feels like the details of that are kind of important. You know, you can't I'll, just like. Do I have to go directly to Mike? Well, and put the order in. You have to like specifically gas for it. You can't just shout randomly in the building. Oh. I want that shirt and expect it to like appear All right, next I'll, to your desk. I'll make a more formal request. I really want the shirt. Creep back toward average, and I think Texans fans should all buy it too because so far, that's what they've done. They've crept back toward average along the offensive line. Now, until last week, Deshaun Watson was getting sacked. Where where do they land in uh, PBE? Twenty Desha- second. Twenty second. Mm-hmm. They're creeping back. Right. Creeping back. 22nd with a quarterback that holds the ball long. Time, Deshaun, so. Right. And Deshaun Watson has uh, been the culprit on uh, a ton of sacks. So of the 12 sacks that we've assigned, okay, the, just that we've assigned, Deshaun Watson has been the the exact culprit on four of them where we say it's, it's just completely on him. Right. It's completely his fault. So there's a few other things where you know things get schemed up or whatever. So four on Deshaun Watson – since giving up two sacks in week one, Larry Tunzel has not given up any, only given up six total pressures other than his two sacks, so that's eight total on the year, 85.8 pass blocking grade. That's really good. Good math. Thank you. Six plus two. See, I can do more than just percentages. Mm. So, you know, simple arithmetic is in there too. So Tunzel has been good. Max Sharping, 50.8 grade, inconsistent. Yeah. This is the best number, though, that I think articulates the creep back toward average thing. What's that? Just in terms of overall grade for all members of the Texans offensive line this season, they rank 15th. Right slap bang in the middle. There it is. Ish. They've crept back toward average. Yeah. And I really think it, those games where Watson's getting sacked four, five, six times, a lot of it is on him trying to create. Sure. I even I pulled out a number the other night, too, because I was looking at we track in rhythm and out of rhythm throws. Do you know for all the great plays Watson makes – outside of the pocket and all that stuff when he's off rhythm in other words you know in rhythm is you get you get to the top of the drop you either hit your first read or you get like one or two hitches to get to your next read and then you're after that you're off rhythm when he's in rhythm he's got the number two pff passing grade in the nfl 91 off rhythm it's a 44 so while he does make those spectacular plays he also takes too many sacks fumbles so if you can knock him off rhythm, or he takes himself off rhythm, he is a completely different quarterback, despite being a really good, um, what seems like he makes a lot of plays outside of structure. You know yeah, what I'm and if you look at the average time in the pocket, so that includes scrambles, you know, plays that turn into scrambles, that kind of thing, he, is, he has the third longest average time to throw. The first the longest is Josh Allen, uh, which again makes sense, that kind of quarterback, right? Yeah. The guy that takes, holds the ball too long. The second is still obnoxiously Kirk Cousins which is just inexcusable. Not that type of quarterback. No. Um, and then the third is Deshaun Watson. The next guy is Marcus Mariota. Again, same kind of quarterback in terms of holds the ball too long, causes a lot of his own problems. Um, then up in the top ten as well are Lamar Jackson, Aaron Rodgers, those kinds of players. Again, hold on to the ball too long. But this is what we're talking about. The Texans' offensive line is still, you know, it's 20, what did I say, 22nd in terms of pass blocking efficiency just by numbers. It's 15th in terms of overall grade. And that's with a quarterback that is stressing them out in terms of um, asking them to do a tougher job than other people. Yeah, so uh, Titus Howard, 61.5 grade. I mean, some of those, those so the two rookies have been, yeah, just okay. Um, you know, but we're seeing overall, like you said, as a unit, it's been better. So that's kudos to the Texans O-line. Yeah. Nick Martin at 
Zach Fulton, 58.9. And then, so if you look at the actual grade breakdowns, it is a bunch of guys who are slightly below average, plus a Laramie Tunsil from a pass blocking standpoint has been well above average. Tunsil has, you know, come into the season, we said, oh, you know, he's, he's not the elite left tackle people think, but he's played up to that level this year. So maybe he has, been, you know, been that guy. I think he's the epitome of the guy that shores up a spot that is so bad that it might take them from 25th to 15th, that, you know, as far as grade goes. Because if they had Julianne Davenport there again, I don't think we're saying telling the same story. No. That I mean, is one you, player strongly impacting things. Um, yeah, I agree. I mean, they paid a lot to make it happen, but nobody ever doubted that the Tunsil thing was an upgrade yeah. for the Texans. You know, like the, oh, it was definitely an upgrade. The issue with the trade is was how much it cost to make it happen. Not that they actually, not that they got a bad player. Right. They definitely got a huge upgrade on the offensive line. Maybe not a guy that was ever going to become, you know, a top one, two, three tackle, but a significant upgrade over the perennial. Well, maybe if Julian Davenport learns how to play, we'll be okay. So good move, and the offensive line, as you say, has successfully achieved creep back toward average status they did it have they become the so first far. offensive line that's actually managed that it was funny because the vikings try almost did it last year they and got close they, and then plunged back down to earth no others others have through the years we can look at other examples i think okay um again it might be tough to recognize it because it does feel like watson's you know watson is still taking more sacks but again the offensive line itself right now laramie tunsil with the number five uh pass blocking grade in the nfl among tackles so that's that's been helpful. Yeah. Um, what else you got? We have a question in the live chat box oh within the within the YouTube video um, from Dara. Oh, I'm going to pronounce that for you because I suspect you'd make a mess of it. Um, Dara O. Basically, there's a lot of – he's talked about it, but there's a lot of people asking the same kind of thing, which is let's talk Christian McCaffrey. Yeah. How – the a, how good is, is he, how valuable is that, and just generally all the stuff around. Because he's getting MVP talk, right? And you know that I hate the MVP as an award, but if we're going to countenance that kind of thing, we have to actually start talking about his value. Right. And how important all that is. Yeah, so I think it's you know it's similar to what we talked about with Le'Veon Bell. I still, you know, as, as good as the Panthers have been now the last few weeks without Cam Newton, and, you know, Christian McCaffrey – a couple of weeks ago, reeling off, you know, getting that big run that was huge. You mentioned, you know, getting a whole bunch of games where he's catching eight, ten passes and all that stuff. It's valuable. I do think people also look just like efficiency standpoint. It's still well below what the top receivers yeah. would would do. Um, I still look at a running back as more the icing on the cake in the offense. So when you have a better re- – you, you'd still rather throw to receivers is the point, right? And if you have a receiver and you have a tight end and then so like if you're the Chiefs, right? And you have Tyree Kill and you have Travis Kelsey, if you then added Christian McCaffrey to that offense, it's like, okay, that's that's incredible. But it's kinda like that third even if he gets all this volume and you know, catching catching eight checkdowns a game isn't all that valuable. It's great for fantasy. It's great for your production. It's great for those numbers that say, Oh, look, he's got more yards than the Jets. But it's Which still not a favorable way to play offense unless the, the places where it is favorable is when you are actually dictating matchups. So to me, I like, I like the, the matchup dictation. I've got him out wide against a linebacker. I've got him a little bit in the screen game where I, yeah, I know I can get him into space. That's different from catching checkdowns. So that's where I think McCaffrey's a little bit inflated from a value standpoint. But I like... The fact that you can use him as a receiver, you can run drags, you can run slants, you can create mismatches, and that is valuable. That's where McCaffrey and Kamara and potentially Saquon separate themselves from the other running backs. Yeah, it was it was it was kind of too perfect for the people that don't you know that hate running backs and think they're not at all valuable in any way, shape, or form. That McCaffrey leaves the game with I think what they were claiming is cramps after the fact, um, and his backup Reggie Bonifan. Reggie Bonifan comes in and breaks off like a sixty-yard run. Former Louisville quarterback right, is what he was. So, is. you know, it doesn't help your case if you're like, McCaffrey's the most important player in any team. He's the MVP, most valuable player in the league. He takes a step to the sideline for a minute to, you know, ease some cramping, and yeah. his backup rattles off a 60-yard, ices the game. 
which is kind of the point in all this, right? Is that, you know, it's not that running backs are bad players. It's not that they don't do, do some great things a lot of the time. It's that by and large, overall, they are a more of a product of their environment than they are crafting their environment. Like they're not the thing determining that they are going to be successful. They're the thing that writes whether the environment is successful or not. I, I like to, um, I like to compare it, you know, when you're in a, class so you're taking a class for with the doctor eric eager say the doctor yes. and he gives you the syllabus and he's like all right class during this semester we're gonna have three big exams and they're gonna be 30 percent each that's 90 percent of your grade but then there's also 10 percent for whatever else it is a special project just class participation just showing up whatever it is i look at running back still as more like the 10 percent, the 15 percent, where if you have the other pieces in place that 10 to 15 percent can be extremely valuable. It could take you from a B to an A, right? It could take you from a C to a B um, just by, by having them there. That's still what I look at with running backs. In the Patriots offense, you don't want to run the offense through James White, but if some of those – if Josh Gordon's taken away and you know your other top – and Edelman's taken away, it's nice to have that next option in a given game where you have the mismatch available. And this is the same thing we said about Le'Veon Bell. In yeah. his prime, like the Steelers weren't run through Le'Veon Bell. It was through Big Ben, Antonio Brown, eventually Juju when he got there. Even though Juju and Le'Veon didn't play together a whole lot, um, it's still Big Ben in the in his receivers. But oh, by the way, when you have Le'Veon running wide receiver routes, that's extremely valuable as a topper there. Yeah. Um, so they they haven't actually run the numbers yet, but just having a, you know knowledge of how the system works. I was asking the doctor, the good doctor, Eric Eager, um, what kind of war number McCaffrey would have. So that's our wins above replacement metric. Apparently they've stolen it from baseball or something, Steve, um, as a concept. I don't, I, mean, I don't know anything about that. But Me neither. I don't um, know anything about baseball. Right. It's, so it's our attempt at creating this wins above replacement number and identifying, literally quantifying the value that players have as opposed to just getting all wishy-washy with it when it comes to MVP time. Um, and basically, if you know anything about PFF's war metric, it's all of the passing components are the important things. Quarterback, obviously the most important position by far. Like the top 20 players are, base, are almost always quarterbacks. After that, it's pass catchers. The guys quarterbacks are actually throwing the ball to. The guys getting the yardage at the end of it. Um, then it's people stopping the pass. Then it's people rushing the passer. Everything to do with the passing game on either side of the ball. Um, and running backs basically are pretty low down the list almost always. McCaffrey is one of the more valuable running backs because he is a vital and useful part of the passing game, as we talked about. He is, um, you know, we've said before, he's, I think he could genuinely play sl at least slot receiver, probably wide receiver, and do it to a decent degree, decent level at, in the NFL. And there aren't many running backs to whom you could say that. There are guys that could be split out for a few plays, but I think he could really play a different position and be fine. Um, so he's good at the right things in order to be valuable. But even with that, they're not as valuable as just a true wide receiver, as you said, or a quarterback. So Eric estimates that his war is on track for something like 0 0.75. I was going to so, say maybe one. Right, right, less than a full win, essentially, above right. replacement. Whereas the top quarterbacks are the guys that are pushing into multiple, multiple yeah, wins. Yeah, they're at three or four. Right, way above the running back. So as good as Christian McCaffrey has been, and as with the Stevenson, you know, you can see the Stevenson is our version of the best players in the NFL. Right, we take value out of it. Forget yeah. the value, just best. How well is he playing? How good is he? He is on that short list. You can definitely make the argument right now that Christian McCaffrey is in the top five best players in the NFL in 2019. You can't really make the argue that the argument that he's among the five most valuable players. If so, anybody going out there and saying McCaffrey deserves MVP consideration only if you have only if you have a flawed interpretation of what value actually is, is that true? If you want to look at why, why war does that, I think the simplest way to do it is to look at essentially how much these guys are adding. How much is the player adding per play, and then how often are they doing it? So the reason why the quarterbacks are the highest is because the best quarterbacks are going to average eight yards per attempt, say, right? And then they're, but they're going to throw the ball 550, 600 times. Right, so that's a ton. Mm -hmm. That's a ton of yards that they're adding. That's a ton of value that they're adding to the team. Not that, that not that all those yards are theirs, but it's just an example, right? The, a good receiver might average fourteen or fifteen per catch times a hundred. So the quarterback's throwing six hundred times. The receiver's right. throwing maybe catching a hundred balls at fourteen or fifteen per if they're really good. 
So that's pretty valuable. Then a running back, just receiving the ball is going to be like 8, 9, 10 yards per reception, well below the receiver. And even if they have the same volume and they get up to 80, 90, or 100 catches, even that's well below the receiver. And then you add in all those carries, and they're, okay, they're 4.5 per pop on the ground times 150. But that, but the difference between 4.5 and, and 4.8 and 4.2 is generally dependent on other people. So that's my simplest explanation of why it's QBs, wide receivers, and tight ends who catch the ball down the field, and then running backs as far as pass game value. Okay. Um, we have another question here that I think you should answer. The Daniel Jones one? No. Oh. Uh, we can answer that one as well. Okay. This one will be shorter. So, but I think it's I think it's best if you answer it. Um, somebody asked, "Did I play football back in Ireland? And if so, what team?" You played for uh, what the heck were they again? The Scorpions? No, no, not the Scorpions. The uh, the Silly Nannies. Huh. Played for the Silly uh, Nannies. Two different teams I played for. Started off playing for the DCU Saints. The Saints. What's your other? What's your team? It's over the Rhinos. There you go. Dublin Rhinos. I played wide receiver for the Saints, and then when they disbanded. Uh, safety went to the went to the rhinos played a little bit of cornerback and then safety you i mean you were the guy that you know, you know he's losing a step at corner yeah, oh, we yeah. gotta move him to safety Absolutely. we gotta move yeah. him to safety yeah I'm you not, know, speed it's a speed game not as fast as i used to be anymore i'm gonna go play safety yeah. what's the name of the league the iafl irish american football league iafl yeah you were what second team all american all second irish team all second team all iafl safety Back w- 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 in what is was, that on your PFF bio? Back in what was definitely my worst season playing, by the way. Like really, their their what I don't even know PFF what the process is, you. but their process is like equivalent to the Pro Bowl. Like, do you have a bunch of tackles? Do you I give up know. a bunch of catches and just make the tackle? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> well, he's got eight tackles per game. He's given up seven catches. But I think that was the season that I like. That was the season where I played badly enough that I'm like, dude, I have to, I have to quit. I can't do this anymore I'm you not, had some pretty good awareness of I, don't how have, I don't have the time to train to get back to being fast so and i'm not yeah. playing being slow so you're I'm, a former I'm safety all right yeah so do you want to do the daniel jones one then to round this off so the question was about daniel jones he threw one essentially where two guys got their hands on it along the side threw into double coverage okay. against the vikings that is an example of a turnover worthy play that was the question is that a turnover worthy play um every pass that gets where a defender gets his hands on the ball is not necessarily a turnover worthy play we take everything into consideration so if you're throwing, say, an out route, and it's very clear the route was run at the proper depth, and the ball's left back and inside, and maybe the corner gets his hands to it, or the safety cuts it off or whatever, or you're not looking off the safety, you're bringing him into the throw, then we'll take all that into, into consideration and say, yeah, that should have been picked. So he had um, three turnover-worthy plays in that game against the Vikings, uh, one of which was picked, and then this one in particular was not picked. So two of them were guys got their hands on it, so he should have thrown three interceptions in that game, only ended up throwing one. So, yeah, absolutely a turnover-worthy play. The other end of the spectrum would be, say, like Baker Mayfield's interception at the goal line the other night where yeah. he puts one. Not a turnover-worthy play. Right. It should have been caught. It wasn't a great ball location, but that pass is caught at the goal line by Antonio Callaway 85% of the time, yeah. say. And that's, so that's a really, good, uh, a really good example of the other end, which where just because it so people would look at that and they say, okay, if you're grading what should have been an interception as an interception, you should grade what should have been a touchdown as a touchdown, and he gets a plus for that, right? But you look at that and you say, well, the ball location wasn't good. It wasn't bad enough to create what happened, like Callaway right. caused the interception, but it wasn't good enough to earn him a positive. So, yes, that should it have was, been a touchdown. It was an expected throw right. anyway. So we give that yeah. a zero, which is expected, it's okay, it's not good, it's right. fine, right? It shouldn't have caused an interception. That's not on Baker. The st- you know the stat goes down for him because you know unlucky, yeah. but the grade doesn't. So Callaway gets a bad grade for screwing up the play, dropping it essentially into an interception. Baker gets a zero because didn't deserve to be an interception. Was not turnover worthy, but neither was it positive. Neither was it a good play that deserved above and beyond what you expect because he was open, and you know the ball location was bad enough to cause an adjustment that ultimately led to an interception there are also plays we might give a negative to a quarterback but it's not necessarily turnover worthy i think the best way to sum up turnover worthy yeah and we have three levels of them those are plays that are going to become interceptions 30 percent of the time 50 percent of the time 80 percent of the time are three levels they're essentially in that bucket right. whereas li- that pass to callaway there's no nuance on twitter they're like that's a bad pass by baker right. it's like no it's a low pass that literally becomes a touchdown between 80 and 90 percent well of the that's time. the thing right so Twitter talk or Twitter and a lot of people talk in terms of good or bad. That's a good pass. That's a bad pass. Well, what about the ones that are somewhere in the middle? 
that the throw to Callaway that became a pick, that wasn't a bad pass. It still should have been a touchdown. Like if he yeah. if Callaway catches that as a routine catch, which most you know most receivers in the NFL would, you wouldn't call it a bad pass. No. You would say that, you know fine. Well, Jimmy but neither is it good because it right. was bad ball location. Right. It was an it was an average expected middle of the road pass. This is exactly why we say we do what we do because the emotional response after stuff just doesn't match with what actually happened. Jimmy G right. came back the next series. He threw a dig route, the deep in, at, at the shoe tops of his receiver, who just caught it and ran for an extra five yards. And it's like, oh, first down. Yeah. Nobody said bad pass. Right. Right. So it's kind of the nuance to what we're doing here at PFF. All right. That it? Yep. All right, guys. Done. There you have it. It's our midweek PFF NFL bonus show here only on YouTube. Be sure to tune in as we preview week six in the NFL tomorrow on YouTube and then anywhere you guys listen to your podcast. Thanks, guys.